Okay, we'll go ahead and begin our program today. Um, thank you all for coming in today. Uh, we will be, we are recording this session. It will be posted to YouTube on Monday. Uh, so if you find this information uh, valuable to you or to your uh, business counterparts in our region, uh, we will make that available. It will go out, out automatically in our Tuesday e-blast, uh, which has got a, a open rate of over 100%. So um, we do get a pretty good following there. Everybody is currently muted. Um, towards the end of the session, we will attempt to answer questions. If you could please ask your questions under the chat function, and that way, uh, you, as, as we're going through the program today, if you think of something that you need to know, put it there. Uh, we will be having our questions answered by our experts towards the end of the program. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, thank, first of all, Greg Shoemate and Frost Brown Todd Attorneys for sponsoring the program today. He is also one of our expert participants. Uh, Greg is the office member in charge in their Florence, Kentucky office. He practices in corporate law, business succession planning, commercial law, and administrative law. He represents a wide variety of businesses, including many family-owned companies, counseling them on various corporate-related matters such as contracts, covenants, not to compete, government incentives, mergers and acquisitions, corporate governance, and succession planning. Greg, thank you. Um, Greg has got a long list of accolades here in Northern Kentucky. He's been involved with uh, several different organizations. Not too many for me to list here, but uh, Greg is well, well known here in the uh, region. Our second expert today in, and on the, our panel is Amy Roberts. She is Vice President Commercial Lending Officer with Central Bank. Um, she's in our Northern Kentucky market with Central Bank and she has more than 20 years of banking experience. Her prior experience includes work on, in treasury management, risk management, audit, and retail banking. She is a graduate of Northern Kentucky University, where she earned her BS in accountancy with a minor in business administration. She was born and raised in Boone County, where she currently resides, and she has volunteered with Area Homeless Support Services and has served on a site-based council with the Boone County Schools. Uh, she was awarded by the Kentucky Bankers Association and recognized as an emerging leader for 2017 through 2018. So thank, thank you, Amy. Uh, without further uh, notice or any more ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Greg. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the, uh, the discussion today. And uh, take it away, Greg. All right, Brian, thank you very much. Gosh, I'm, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm blushing. Um, you, all those kind things that you, you had to say. I, I need to update my, uh, my, my bio, though, because um, I've been working on PPP loans, et cetera, uh, almost nonstop, um, gosh, since the middle of March. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, it's, it's been, it's been a, a very interesting time here at our firm. Um, early on, in fact, even before um, the uh, various states started um, adopting their uh, stay-at-home orders, um, we saw the need to help our clients through all the various issues that come about because of a pandemic like this. Um, I've asked uh, Brian to put up on the screen. Uh, we, we formed a coronavirus uh, response team, um, and this was well before the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act just kind of became a, a portion or a subset of it. But, you know, you can imagine with all the return to work issues, um, all of the things, you know, related to the coronavirus. Uh, I think a lot of us learned uh, during this period what force majeure meant. Um, I, I remember reading contracts with clients who don't like the, quote, boilerplate in a contract, and they'd always ask me, though, you know, what does force majeure mean? Uh, well, we're learning. Uh, we're learning pretty quickly. Um, so um, we have a very robust coronavirus response team. I think we have about 50 to 60 lawyers on it from all different areas of the firm. Um, if you would like to receive our updates, uh, Brian, if you could scroll down a little bit, I believe on the top, or up, I'm sorry. Um, I believe there is, yes, there is a, um, there's a, there's a, uh, a link on there that shows how to get onto our uh, coronavirus um, uh, daily newsletter that we have. Um, there's a lot of very good information on there. I highly recommend, uh, you know, at worst case scenario, it just gives you something to delete uh, in your inbox every day, but I don't think you will be. I think you'll be reviewing it. So uh, if you're interested, visit our website, go to the coronavirus response team and uh, sign up for the uh, daily uh, updates. 
All right, that's my commercial. Um, so let's get started. Um, wow. Um, those of you who know me in the community, you know I'm a rock and roll guy. Um, you know, as uh, Jerry Garcia said, what a long, strange trip it's been, you know. Um, it's been a very humbling experience for us. Every time we feel like we uh, get a handle on at least what we think uh, the rules and regulations are with regard to the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Dis uh, Disaster Loan Program, uh, the rules change. And quite frankly, they've been changing almost daily. Uh, so it's taken a lot of uh, effort uh, to stay up on it. But, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, as we as we have winded through this process, it certainly had its ups and downs. But I think, you know, we're at a much better place today than we were when they first rolled these programs out. Um, I know, um, you know, for those of you who have been following, uh, the CARES Act was first adopted on March 27th by Congress. Uh, in fact, uh, it's interesting, I was uh, giving a present a webinar at that time on March 27th um, uh, for uh, Triad and the Chamber. And um, we were talking about what we expected in the CARES Act and it actually passed um, the Senate while we were on the uh, conference call. So, um, you know, this, this has actually been around now for about two months. And uh, quite frankly, it's, 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 had its, it's had its changes and its twists and turns. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the information we've gotten uh, since the CARES Act was adopted with regard to PPP loans and, and et cetera, et cetera, has been published by the Department of the Treasury and the SBA on their websites, um, mainly in the form of IFRs, as we call them, uh, the interim final rules. Uh, there have been 11 so far since the CARES Act was passed two months ago. Um, we've also been getting guidance in the form of what they call frequently asked questions or FAQs. Uh, the last one actually came out May 27th. So far, there's been uh, 48 questions on the list, although I can tell you that some of the advice that we get and some of the advice that has been placed on those FAQs um, have been inconsistent with prior advice. Um, and so uh, there's 48, but that doesn't mean there's only been 48 questions answered. They obviously rightfully and smartly delete the ones that were earlier that conflict with the later guidance. So anyway, um, so there's, so, so those are, have been our two reference points. Uh, most recently on May 15th, the uh, forgiveness uh, application form for the PPP loan came out. Uh, it was publicized on the SBA's website. We're gonna get into the form uh, here later in the program. Um, but that gave us additional guidance as to what the SBA was going to be looking at. Um, there were some new things that came out as a result of the application, things that we were either suspecting or surprised us um, on May 15th. Um, one of which was, you know, I, we're, we're gonna get into the eight week period here shortly, et cetera, but you know, the loan, the loan proceeds um, were mandated to be spent during the eight week period. Uh, most people thought that that meant that the proceeds had to be both incurred in that eight week period and spent. Well, the guidance we got through the application form uh, indicated that actually it was either paid or incurred. And again, we'll get into that later, but uh, you know, that was one of the ideas. There was a concept called the alternate payroll period, which was new. Uh, we got some formal guidance finally, although there was a lot of speculation about bonuses um, and uh, bonuses are allowed to be paid by PPP um, uh, proceeds. And in addition, we got some more definition around the concept of owner's compensation, which is now permitted expressly um, um, for the PPP loan. Um, I wanted to do a little sidetrack for a minute. Most of my presentation today is going to focus on the Paycheck Protection Program loans and the forgiveness, um, but I do want to mention the economic injury disaster loans. Um, unlike the PPP, those are true loans. Um, there is a small forgivable portion 
of the uh, of the uh, EIDL, um, and it's only ten thousand uh, dollars. We just have not had as many clients taking advantage of uh, that loan program, and uh, quite frankly, most of the media attention, et cetera, has been on the PPP. Um, just to give you a few highlights of the EDIL program, uh, the loan is a, a true loan. Uh, it's payable over a 30-year period at a 3.75 interest rate. Um, you can get, again, $10,000 of it uh, forgiven. Um, the purpose of the um, loan is uh, to obviously help businesses uh, recover from an economic uh, disaster. Um, and um, the limitation on the spending is not as uh, restrictive as a PPP loan, um, so it doesn't have to be mostly spent on payroll, but all of the expenses um, must be related directly to economic injury incurred because of COVID-19. Um, so anyway, so uh, I guess enough said on the EDIL. So let's talk about uh, the PPP loans and the, and, the, and the process as we know it now. Um, as I was preparing for this uh, webinar um, yesterday afternoon, uh, the House passed a new uh, law and it's now called the PPP Flexibility Act. It passed almost unanimously in the House. It has now been sent to the Senate. Um, I'm still going to be talking today, assuming uh, the prior rules before the adoption. Um, the three major changes that we will see, though, are that the amount of the proceeds that have to be used for payroll um, will be reduced under this new act from 75% to 60%. Um, in addition, uh, I referenced earlier the eight week period uh, during which the proceeds need to be spent. Um, the eight week period under the new act would be expanded to 24 weeks. Um, and then finally, uh, the deadline for the safe harbor, which again, we'll get into in a minute, but that's the where you can bring back your employees or restore their pay to their prior level. Um, that under the act would be extended to December 31st. Currently it's June 30th. Um, so uh, that's on the horizon. Um, I've read a number of different commentaries. They do expect the Senate to adopt some version of this, but um, apparently uh, there's been some resistance to some of the provisions in there. Uh, so uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm sure they'll be uh, conferring about it and we'll hear more about it next week. So um, what was the purpose of the Paycheck Protection Program? I, and, I, and I talk about that only because a lot of the guidance that has come out recently, especially, um, harkens back to the original purpose of the loan, which is a good thing. Um, the whole purpose of the act was to keep people at work or to put people back to work who had been laid off as a result of the coronavirus. Um, so keep those concepts in mind when it comes to things like, you know, what can we spend the money on? Why is the period what it is, et cetera? Um, you may recall at the time, March 27th, most people thought that June 30 was a good date to assume that most businesses would be back at full throttle. Um, as we have found out, they haven't. Particularly the restaurant industry has been hit hard uh, by the coronavirus. And quite frankly, um, the restaurant industry lobby, which is pretty powerful, uh, was one of the driving forces behind the adoption of the Flexibility Act yesterday. Um, so what is a PPP loan? Well, it's actually a loan. Now it's a forgivable loan. Uh, so it kind of sounds like a grant, but it's really a loan. Um, and what are the terms of the loan? Well, the, the maturity date on these loans is two years, and that's two years from the date that you initially receive the proceeds from your bank. Uh, the interest rate on the loan is 1%. I know when we first started talking to clients about this, a number of clients who were hesitant to apply for the loan said, well, what if we got to pay it back? And I said, well, where else are you going to get a loan for 1%? You know, um, so, you know, the terms of the loan itself are actually um, very good. 
Um, and even if you do have to pay some or all of the proceeds back, a 1% loan ain't all bad. Um, but everyone at, these, at this point is focusing on the forgiveness portion. Um, unlike uh, the economic injury disaster loan, um, the entire amount of the PPP loan is subject to forgiveness. And hopefully, I think most businesses' goal would be to have all of it forgiven. Uh, so we're going to talk about what that is, what the process is. Uh, the concept is, is that during the eight-week period, which is what we refer to as the covered period, uh, during that eight-week period, uh, the money should be spent on the proper purposes, which are for payroll expenses and for other eligible expenses. Now, the current limit and the proration of those two expenses are that the, under the current terms, uh, the CARES Act provides that we have to spend 75% uh, of the loan proceeds on um, applicable payroll expenses um, and 25% on the expenses. Um, the um, payroll definition, I know I've had a number of questions on what constitutes payroll. Um, it's obviously the cash portion of the payroll payment, but it also includes employer contributions to health plans, employer contributions to retirement plans, um, and, and uh, related benefit uh, expenses. Um, now, a lot of, there's been a lot of conversation uh, with my clients on the practicality of when they can use the PPP loan proceeds uh, for their payroll costs. Um, and there, there was some difficulty in keeping the accounting straight because obviously uh, most people's loan was not received on the same day that a payroll period ended or began. Um, the, uh, the new guidance that we received and the SBA and in, 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 in reviewing that issue um, has come up with new guidance, which um, is in the form of a new program called the Alternative Payroll Covered Period. Um, and suffice it to say that, you know, your eligible payroll cost can either be one of two periods, either the eight weeks starting the day you receive the loan proceeds or, and I'm oversimplifying here, but or it could be the first day of the first payroll period that your company has after you receive the loan proceeds. So if you're on a biweekly payroll period um, and you got the loan proceeds three days into it, your proceeds or your period could start 10 days after you receive the loan proceeds. Um, eligible non-payroll costs, what, do that, what does that include? Um, well, it includes um, interest on mortgages, lease expenses, um, personal property rentals, which would include equipment rentals, et cetera, utility payments and the like. Uh, again, uh, all of that is defined uh, in the frequently asked questions and the interim final rules. Um, but, you know, and again, subject to the proration cap vis-a-vis -vis payroll. Um, so let's talk about forgiveness. What, is that, what does that look like? Um, well, as I mentioned before, we received the first application on May 15th. I will tell you that if the Flexibility Act passes and we expect it to, the application that I've got, the one that we're going to put on the screen here in a minute, um, is probably going to be out of date because it assumes the 75% uh, proration. Um, it also assumes the eight-week uh, spending period. So um, we're likely going to be getting a new form, um, assuming the, 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 the Flexibility Act passes. But for now, I think for discussion purposes, at least the concepts, I think, uh, will all be the same. Um, so the, and, and we're going to talk about this later, but the idea of the forgiveness is, is you're going to take your eligible expenses, which include payroll and 25% of other eligible expenses. You are going subject to the guardrails that we're going to talk about. I've been, I've heard a number of other commentators calling them guardrails. I, you can call them deductions. You can call them whatever you want but subject to deductions for things like reduction in workforce, reduction in 
um, and, and pay to each individual employee. But the idea is, is that the amount that you spend during the covered period uh, would be the amount that can be forgiven subject to those guardrails and subject to the 75-25 proration. Um, and what, what will happen is, so, so we got the new application out May 15th. Um, you will fill out the application. We'll get into the process here and what that's going to look like in a minute. Um, you will apply, and then what happens is if all of the proceeds are not eligible for forgiveness, then you'll just revert back to the terms of the loan, and you will have to repay the loan on the two-year maturity date from the date you receive the funds. So how do we get forgiven? Well, the first step is going to be to fill out the application. Um, and the process of that is that, first of all, you're going to complete the application with all the documentation. Um, you're going to get that to your lender. Um, once, once you get that to your lender, and by the way, a lot of people are asking, is there a deadline on that? Is there, you know, the only, the only, the only restriction um, that we have as guidance right now is, is that it has to be filed after the eight week period is complete, which is semi-obvious, right? Because you won't be able to, to do all of the reporting until the period's over. So once the covered period, again, now it's eight weeks, it may be expanded. Um, once that period is over, then, the, uh, then you can file the, the application uh, for forgiveness. Um, there's no deadline for it at the present time though. Um, I would suggest to you that you know the SBA is going to be um, processing a lot of these applications, um, as are your banks. I would suggest that unless you want to sit around and wait and worry about whether or not your loan is going to be forgiven uh, and all of the things that does to your balance sheet, um, I would think that you would want to get your application in sooner rather than later. Now, you know I've had other advisors say you don't want to be the first guinea pig to file. I agree, because there's going to probably be a lot of tweaks to the process when people start filing the forgiveness applications. But I also probably wouldn't wait until the fall, just because you probably want to get some finality on what's going to happen with the loan. Can you move it off of your books as a, um, as a, uh, a, a debt, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to submit the application to your lender. Uh, once you submit it to the lender, the lender has 60 days to review your application and to make a determination as to uh, whether or not you're eligible for forgiveness. Um, once it does that, it will certify it and send that to the SBA. Now, we don't really have any guidance on what the SBA is specifically going to do with it. Um, we don't know whether or not it's going to be a, they'll take whatever the bank sends them and ship a check out for the forgiveness amount. We don't know at this point. But there is a provision for SBA review of these um, uh, forgiveness applications. Um, once the SBA has reviewed it, they have six, they're, they're, I'm sorry, they have 90 days to review it. Uh, they will then submit the payment to the bank. Uh, the payment will be not only for the loan proceeds themselves, but also for the 1% interest. Um, and again, to the extent that you have a portion of your loan that is not forgiven, then we revert back to the maturity date of your note. It'll be paid with 1% interest uh, in that two-year period. Um, I've invited um, Amy Roberts from Central Bank to join us. Um, I, 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 I've had a lot of questions from clients. Once the application came out, I started talking with our clients I had a lot of questions about, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, you know, can we use Excel spreadsheets? Should, you know, can we use electronic submissions? What, you know, what does that look like? Does it have to be paper? Who do we send it to? All those kind of things. Um, and, and so I've, I've asked Amy to join us uh, to talk a little bit about what Central Bank envisions the, um, uh, the process um, to look like from their perspective. I will tell you, I've been working with Central Bank ever since the CARES Act passed on paycheck protection loans. Um, in my opinion, they've become the expert on it locally. Uh, they've done such a fantastic job 
on getting loans uh, processed and approved and paid uh, that Senator Mitch McConnell called uh, the bank president, uh, Luther Deaton, and commended him on the amount of loans that Central Bank was able to process, which is, you know, again, a great thing for not only their customers, but our community. So I really wanted to give a good shout out to, to Central Bank because they've really done a nice job. So Amy, are you on? I'm on the line, Greg. Yes, and thank you. Thank you for the kind words about ah, Central Bank. No, it's all well-deserved. Amy, um, real quick, uh, just take a few seconds and tell tell everyone what the original application process looked like from your perspective, only because I'm envisioning that when we go to file for loan forgiveness, it's going to at least look somewhat similar to that. So could you share with us what it looked like from your perspective? Sure. Well, as you can imagine, it was pretty much what you would expect. We had a very large volume of applications, but along with the applications were a lot, a lot of questions. And when this all started coming about, you know, we were waiting on guidance um, from the SBA. Uh, but we had tons of applications from a lot of different industries. Um, but once we were able to get that guidance, we reacted quickly to establish a process to accept the applications. And then we were sitting basically waiting for that SBA loan portal to open up. So all of the loan applications had to be put in individually, which is different. Some banks handled it differently, but we at Central Bank, we did the application process for the borrower. So we input that information um, for them. Once we got that process working, we were able to do a large volume of loans complete in a short period of time. Um, but the thing is with these, app with these loans, regardless of the loan amount, it takes the same amount of underwriting, the same amount of work, the same amount of input. So we kind of handled all the loans um, the same. And the interesting part for us is that once these loans were approved and we got approval, they all had to be closed within 10 calendar days um, of the, the approval. So if you can imagine, we had all different applications at all different stages of the process at any given time. So it was a little chaotic, but we, we did it. <laughs> Amy, just to give everyone an idea, and I don't know if it's for public record or not, but um, how many how many SBA loans do you think you processed? Here in Northern Kentucky, just our market, the first wave before the first round of funding ran out, we did about 400 loan applications. And then when those funds were replenished, we did an additional 250 to 275. Uh, so about almost 700 up here. The bank as a whole, we did close to 2,200. That is a lot of loan applications. A lot, yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, for those of you who did not follow the uh, banking portion of this, um, you know, the, the SBA, when, when the loan applications were being processed, uh, yes, the bank submitted them, but the bank wasn't obligated at that time to do any certifications. They weren't obligated to to, 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 to make any representations to the SBA. They weren't obligated to review documents. They were simply submitting. Um, that's changed though, um, with regard to the loan forgiveness program. Um, as, of, as of right now, uh, the guidance that we have is, is that the banks are the ones that are required to review the loan forgiveness application and, des and determine eligibility. Uh, Amy, is that what you're hearing as well? Yes, we are, um, and we're expecting, you know, just like on the front end, you know, a lot, all, all the customers want their loans forgiven, right? So we're expecting all the customers to come, you know, when that eight-week window opens and, and start the process for, for the forgiveness. Um, as a bank, you know, we started thinking about this process, the forgiveness process, kind of at the same time as the application process. And we've decided that we are going to partner with a third-party service provider that's created like a portal uh, that our borrowers will use where they can upload information and we are trying to promote consistency and make the the process as standard as possible even though we expect like you said excel spreadsheets or different payroll reports or all kind of different information from our borrowers so amy do you so do you anticipate i guess when a when a when a customer of the bank contacts the bank do you anticipate that you will then refer them to the portal or are you going to actively communicate with your customers, how how's that process going to work? Oh no, we're we're going to actively communicate with them. We don't we don't want anybody to guess or to worry because then it's going to create, you know, phone calls and questions. So we plan on 
depending on whether we have eight weeks or 24 weeks, we're kind of in limbo right the second, but we're going to send some just updated information and this is what we know and this is how it's going to do in an email here shortly to our borrowers, kind of introducing them to the portal and explaining what we're going to want them to do when the time comes. Amy, I know um, you might not know the answer to this question. I, a good lawyer is not supposed to ask a question that they don't know the answer to, but do you know for, for those that are out there that um, have a different banking relationship, do you know what other banks in town are going to be doing? Are they going to be hiring a uh, a, a third party provider and having portals as well, or do you know? I don't know, but I would anticipate that being the case. I've, you know, you bankers talk and you hear things in the community. A lot of the loan process on the front end to apply and even to get the PPP funds, they used a platform where people would go on and apply and input their own information, which is a little bit different than the style we have. So I would assume that they would be doing something similar, yes. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Amy, and thanks so much for participating. Um, Amy's going to stay you. on in case any of the questions at the end um, involve banking-related uh, questions. So, Amy, thanks again, and I appreciate it. So, no problem. Thank you. Let's talk about. Let's look at this actual application. Uh, I don't know how many on the on the uh, webinar now have have actually had a chance. Uh, to see this application yet. Um, let's see, Brian, can it scroll, can you scroll up a little bit? No, up, yeah, there, you go. Oh, there it is, okay. So you'll see, um, you know, this, this is the form that the SBA and the Department of Treasury posted on their websites. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, uh, this was posted May 15th, but I will tell you that this form is going to need to be changed uh, in the event that the uh, new act, uh, the Flexibility Act passes or something like it. Uh, but again, I don't anticipate a lot of the concepts that are in here to change. Um, one thing you'll note on here up in the right hand corner, the first thing I noted was it has an expiration date of uh, October 31st of this year. And you know, my first thought was, are they telling us that's the deadline? I don't think the answer is that it's it's the deadline. All federal forms have an app or an expiration date. You know, you'll even see on your tax forms that they have an expiration date. So I think that was just a random date that they that they picked. Um, in fact, if the period is extended to December 31st, it's going to have to go beyond this year uh, anyway um, for that. So. Um, the kind of the outline of what this application looks like, it's a uh, it's an 11 page form, but your submission will be significantly larger than 11 pages. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, page one of the form, um, uh, in fact, page one and page two of the form are instructions. Um, so, you know, you can, you can look to see there's a uh, there's a, there's a number of different things that have been covered in the past by frequently asked questions, um, but you'll see where they give specific instructions, again, similar to a tax form or something along those lines. Um, page three, um, let me bring that up, Brian. Okay, so page three is what I would call your summary sheet. This is where you'll do the, the final calculations. Uh, you'll see that at the top there's some information required, and then toward the bottom uh, of this of this uh, application form, uh, you'll see where you begin the calculations. These calculations are going to be supported by schedules, and they're going to be supported by additional documentation that you're going to need to submit to the SBA. Um, page four. <clears throat> Yes, we have more certifications. Uh, for those of you who have been following the process, you know there's been a lot of controversy regarding the um, certifications in the original loan applications. Um, you all may have heard that some large publicly traded companies, some companies including the Los Angeles Lakers and um, Shake Shack and Ruth's Chris Steakhouse applied for and received very large PPP loans. There was a lot of criticism um, in the community about that or in, in the country about that. 
um, that inspired the Treasury Secretary to call a press conference. Um, that press conference probably yielded more phone calls to our office than any press conference I've seen. Um, I think he scared the bejeebers out of everybody because he said, you know, anybody that uh, filed one of these applications, signed certifications, the certifications basically provided that you had no other access to capital, um, you know, leading to questions like, well, if I have a personal account and I'm the sole owner of my business, is that access to capital? Um, you know, what if I have a piggy bank in my backyard, et cetera? Um, and so the application got a lot of, or the, the press conference got a lot of blowback after that. People started uh, deciding whether or not they wanted to repay the loan immediately. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about a safe harbor period where, you know, the, uh, the uh, SBA said, you know what, um, all is forgiven if you pay the money back by a deadline. That deadline kept getting expanded. Um, and so as a result of all that controversy, uh, a lot of the guidance that we're now getting um, has brought a lot of relief uh, to us, to our clients, uh, to their advisors and accountants. Um, the, the whole idea of, you know, the certification, um, you know, at, at one time, uh, Secretary Mnuchin had said that all of the applications for loan forgiveness were going to be audited uh, to make sure that you had no other access to capital, among other things. Um, you know, the good news is, is that if your loan is under $2 million, uh, you are now expressly assumed to have met all of the certification requirements in your original documentation. So I know that brought a lot of relief to a lot of our clients who had loans under 2 million. Um, if your loan is over 2 million, um, again, rest assured that you're still gonna have your loan forgiveness application reviewed. Um, the penalties that were threatened before, which Again, secretary, the secretary and his infinite wisdom decided to throw out things like felony fraud and uh, jail time, et cetera. Um, I think a lot of that's by the wayside at this point. Um, but you know, suffice it to say, if your loan is over two million, you should expect um, an SBA review of your application. Um, and in fact, uh, on page one, page three of the application, it's actually the front cover sheet. Um, you have to say whether or not you received a loan of over two million. That will trigger the review. Uh, these certifications that are on this page, much much less concerning, um, and you can read through those. Um, you know, at, when 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 you go to fill out the application. Um, the next page, page five of the application. Um, are your instructions for the schedules. Um, once we, uh, in, here, here in a few minutes, we're gonna talk about the calculations at a high level. I will give a disclaimer right now. I'm not gonna have time today to get into the details of the calculations. Quite frankly, they are extremely complicated. I've heard some of the best experts in the business debating on what can be done and what needs to be done in those schedules. So um, there's a lot, there's still a lot of sifting through that's gonna go on, but we will talk about what that's gonna look like at a very high level. Um, so you'll see Schedule A, uh, which will be also supported by documentation. Um, and then you've got uh, the next page on page seven of the application is instructions for your worksheet. And um, I don't know if you, are you on seven? I think that's six, Brian, I think, I can't see, yeah. So on page seven, we've got further instructions for the Schedule A worksheet, uh, page eight the same way. Your worksheet itself is on page nine. Um, I've had a number of clients ask me about this particular worksheet. Can we use Excel spreadsheets instead of this sheet? Uh, the truth is you're gonna have to, unless you have eight or fewer employees, you'll see on the schedule there that uh, there's fewer, there's, there, there's fewer um, lines than there are likely that most of you have employees. 
Um, and then on um, and then on page ten, I wanted to get to page ten and direct your attention to page ten. I think it's very important. Uh, I've had a number of clients ask me, so what documents are we going to need? What what's going to be submitted? Um, also, is there any requirement that we keep any documents? Um, if you look at page 10, you'll see that there are there's a list at the top um, that says these are the documents that you will have to submit with the PPP loan forgiveness application. Um, you'll see on Schedule A what is going to need to be uh, submitted to document your payroll, et cetera. Um, and so these will actually be submitted as part of your loan forgiveness application. Um, if you scroll down a little further, it, if you're looking at the page physically, it's probably about 75% of the way down on the page. There's that 75 number again. Um, you'll see that these, there's also a list of documents that you have to keep on file at your, at your company, but will not be submitted with the, uh, with the application. Um, you have to keep these by these instructions you'll see at the very bottom. Uh, you have to keep the information for at least six years after the date the loan is forgiven. Uh, so page 10 it has a nice checklist of all the documentation requirements. Um, I would suggest that everyone go ahead and get a start on this application now. Um, and at least familiarize yourself with what it is you're going to need to be submitting and what it is you're going to need to keep of record so that you can start, um, you know, when it comes time to actually run the calculations, you'll, you'll have the documentations at your fingers. I will tell you that, you know, I've had a lot of clients complain about some of the documentation requirements. Um, the calculations are going to require that you have information on each and every employee who you are applying for the payroll reduction on. And, um, you know, again, we'll talk at a high level about that in a minute, but I will tell you this, your payroll companies, your HR directors are going to become your best friends when it comes time to uh, preparing and submitting this application. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the calculations. I'm gonna, I want to make sure we save time for uh, questions at the end. So I'm going to run through the calculations themselves fairly quickly. Um, and, and, and again, with a, with a note that a lot of this is subject to revision and change. Um, so what does the computation, the base computation look like? Um, well, as we discussed earlier, the portion of the loan that is eligible for forgiveness could be up to the entire amount. Uh, hopefully it's up to the entire amount. Uh, subject to these guardrails, as, as I've been calling them, uh, on, the, on the amount. So at a high level, what you would hope is, is that if you take your loan proceeds, and hypothetically, let's say we've got a company that has borrowed a uh, million dollars, and during that eight week period, they have spent 750,000 on approved payroll expenses and 250,000 on expenses, okay? So they've spent the full million dollars during that eight week period, again, remembering that it's paid or incurred during that period. Um, theoretically, that client ought to be able to say, okay, I'm done, right? I've spent it, I've got documentation that I spent it, um, whatever I need to submit to prove that I spent it, um, and, and, and I'm done. And quite frankly, in a perfect world, that's what we were hoping would happen as well, but that's not quite the way it's, it, it's happening. Remember early on in the presentation, I said, I think it's a good idea for us to make sure we keep in mind what the original purpose of the PPP loan program was, and that was to keep people working if people had been laid off already to bring them back to work and to keep them working at their current compensation levels. So as a result, the adjustments that we're gonna be talking about are focused on employee retention and the amount of employees that were retained and the amount of compensation each individual employee received. 
uh, the guardrails are largely focused around, so how many employees did we have before? How many employees did we have during the eight week period? Um, and to the extent that we had fewer employees during the eight week period than we had before, then we're gonna have an adjustment downward on what portion of our loan proceeds is eligible for forgiveness. Same thing with the individual salary. So that the adjustment with regard to what I'm calling the FTE quotient or the full-time equivalent quotient um, is at a company level. So it's determined at a company level. Now, what that's gonna require you to do is, and, and there's a detailed calculation with an alternate uh, format for doing the calculation, but effectively at a high level, what you're gonna have to do is calculate how many FTEs your company had during what's called the reference period. There are two options for the reference period. Your reference period could either have been February 15 of 2019 through June 30 of 2019, or you can also use an alternate reference period of the same time in 2020. Um, then once you've determined what your average FTE was during that period of time, then you compare that to the average FTE during the covered period, which again is the eight week period of, 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 of spending. Um, to the extent that you had the same number of full-time equivalents, then your quotient is gonna be one or 100%. So you're not gonna have any reduction for, for your FTE quotient. Um, the next calculation, the next guardrail, the next item that would subject your loan forgiveness to deduction um, is the individual employee analysis or the individual reduction in compensation. The schedules, and as you read through them, your head's gonna spin. Again, um, I suggest uh, you might wanna send a, a gift or a bonus to your uh, payroll company and or your HR people uh, because they're, they've got a lot of work to do. Um, and what's gonna have to happen is, is an analysis is gonna have to happen for each individual employee um, to determine whether or not their compensation is the same now as it was in the, what we call the reference period. So again, the same period of time that we talked about before, um, February 15 through June 30 of either 2019 or 2020. If an employee's compensation had been reduced during the covered period, so during the eight week period, then that employee's compensation will be, will be reduced from your loan forgiveness. Not the entire amount, but the proportion that relates to their reduction in salary. So for example, if you've got an employee uh, who made during that eight week period $10,000 and they, um, they only made 70% uh, of what they made before, roughly speaking, and again, the calculations are not quite this simple, but roughly speaking, there's gonna be a reduction of 30% of the amount of loan forgiveness for the compensation related to that employee. So again, you will need to go through the compensation through the schedules, uh, you will see how that's done. Then, once those two computations are, are completed, you've come up with your total amount that's eligible for loan forgiveness on a payroll side. So let's say in my hypothetical, the million dollars, uh, let's say that you know, you've, you've, you, you, you spent 750,000 on payroll, but for one reason or another, you've had $100,000 that have been reduced well, then what happens is you're only eligible for forgiveness for the 650. And at that point, your quotient, your applicable payroll expense versus your other expenses will then come into play. So that's when the 7525 is applied. I've had a lot of clients ask me, okay, is it my gross, what I'm claiming originally on the gross payroll or is it after adjustments? The 7525 is after adjustments. So um, again, um, another, another guardrail around it, uh, around what you can receive on your loans. To the extent that you kept all of your employees employed and to the extent that you 
kept your compensation levels at the same levels they were before, then you should be able to be forgiven for the full 75, 25 amount of your expense, which theoretically, if your numbers are consistent with what you submitted with your original loan application, that would mean your total amount of your loan ought to be forgiven. Again, as we said before, what happens if you go through this process and you find out some of the loan or all of the loan, quite frankly, will not be forgiven, uh, you have two years from the date of the original loan to pay back the loan with interest. So all that being said, I know that was a whole lot, um, and I apologize for not getting our sleeves rolled up and getting into the actual calculations themselves, but uh, I don't think that we have enough time. We probably need to schedule a 10-hour session to, to handle all of that at this point. So uh, with that being said, um, Brian, I turn it back to you and see if we have any questions. Okay, we do not have any questions in the chat box, but if you do have a question you want to ask it verbally, please unmute yourself to ask your, your uh, question. Brian, as they say, that means one of two things. Either we did a great job and everybody understands everything, or we lost them back when I started talking about uh, uh, the the original CARES Act adoption. <laughs> well, I know that there's, that there's, that there's more, more coming up, Greg. I uh, want to thank you again today for your presentation and uh, for your sponsorship of the event. Again, uh, this, uh, this broadcast is brought to you by Frost Brown Todd Attorneys. Uh, Greg's been a good partner of ours. Our general counsel uh, is a, a partner with, uh, with Frost Brown Todd. And uh, we really appreciate all that you've been able to do and all the sleepless nights that you probably had working on these PPP loans and that we actually did receive an EIDL loan ourselves. And so I know we're going to be asking for some personal advice uh, after, after this, this uh, call. Um, thanks again, Greg. Thank you, Amy, for, for helping out and, and, uh, and pinch hitting there. I know that we're, we're going to have some, probably some phase four come in. Uh, best as we can tell, later part of June, probably after the second week. Uh, so the third or fourth week of, of June, you'll see Senator McConnell work through another phase four bill, which will probably release a little bit of additional backfilling into these in these small business administration programs. Uh, moving forward, folks, again, we are going to we have recorded this session. We will put it up on YouTube and share it on our social media and send it out through our e-blast next Tuesday. Uh, we do have three other webinars as part of this series coming up. The uh, first one is our economic outlook after the virus. Uh, Dr. Robert Dietz, he's our chief economist at the National Association of Home Builders, will give, be giving that present, present presentation. As things look, it looks like the housing market is already beginning to rebound. Uh, we've had a slight uptick in April uh, over uh, the prior month uh, when most economists said that we were going to be down to 40 percent. We were actually increased by 0.2 percent. Uh, it's also being exacerbated by the fact that a lot of people are worried about putting their houses on the market and having open houses and people come into them. So we've only got about a two to three month inventory in the, in the resale market right now. So it is accelerating new, new home production. And we expect uh, the coming months of, of May and June to begin to accelerate uh, and, and that the construction industry is going to pull us out of this economic malaise just like we had during normal um, during, during normal downturns. Unfortunately, the last downturn in the Great Recession, we were one of the causes of it. So we, we were one of the last to come out. Our, uh, our third part in the series is going to be uh, what, what life is like in Washington, D.C., what's going up on Capitol Hill during times of the coronavirus. <clears throat> this will, it's uh, sponsored by Duke Energy. Uh, our presenter that day is a gentleman by the name of Jim Tobin. Jim is our Executive Vice President of Legislative Affairs for the National Association of Home Builders. Uh, Jim and I talk almost on a daily basis, so we're very attuned as to what's going on and what may be changing with these with these loan programs and what other sort of recovery uh, efforts that that there that there that there that there may may be. Uh, our last in this series will be on June 23rd. It is uh, COVID-19 federal tax changes. What you need to know. Uh, the gentleman that will be presenting this is an associate vice president with the National Association of Home Builders. His name is J.P. Delmore. He is our tax specialist on Capitol Hill. So J.P. has been involved in some of these tax changes. And so on June 23rd, uh, we'll have a webinar um, uh, featuring JP, and so we can catch everybody up with some of these tax changes. There may be some other changes having to do with some of these tax cuts and tax credits and uh, payroll de de deferments. 
Uh, we're making an effort right now, although it's not the case, uh, but the effort we're making, Greg, may, may be interest to, to you and, and, and Amy, is that uh, we may be close to allowing people to not only take the PPPL loan program, but also take uh, payroll tax deferment too. Uh, but that, again, may not happen until about this time that this webinar comes out on the 23rd. So it should be very timely if we do get a phase four and roll through, we may have some very timely changes to, to let you know. So again, Amy, Greg, thank you very much. Greg, thank you for your sponsorship today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. We will get this out on the internet and thank you everybody for attending today. Have a wonderful weekend.